try to raise my voice all the way to the end. John, tell me if, if you can't hear me without the mic. Well, uh, since I was a kid, I always uh, looked for the tough questions in the Bible. Uh, who were the giants in the Bible? Who were, um, uh, you know, this, this group of people and uh, uh, these tough questions that usually as a teenager you would ask. But one thing that was very interesting for me was a statement given by God about a man. And uh, we're going to read and we're going to get to this statement in a, in a second here. So uh, my reading today is from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13 tells us about the Philistines who had, uh, of course they were at war with the Israelites. And as they were at war with the Israelites, they were always planning attacks and fights and battles uh, wherever they, they could. So, first uh, Samuel chapter 13, at the beginning of it, it starts telling us about the Philistines uh, putting together a number of the army, of their army, to start fighting the Israelites. So, also on the other hand, Saul, the king of the Israelites at that time, also has uh, prepared for the, for the battle. Uh, and I'm going to start from uh, verse uh, chapter 7. I mean, verse, uh, verse 7 from chapter 13. First Samuel 13, uh, verse 7. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier. But Samuel did, still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him. But Samuel said, What is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, The Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you come, before you came. How foolish, Samuel explained. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. <coughs> But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. This is the story, and the verse uh, number 14 is the statement that always grabbed my attention since I was a teenager. A God, the big God, God of the universe, talking about a man and com complimenting him and saying, he is a man after my own heart. This was probably one of the most fascinating uh, questions that I asked and, and that got my attention in the Bible. All the other stuff, how did the flood happen, how did it cover the whole world, all these like tough questions you might ask are, are really hard questions and you, you, we all want answers for them, we want to understand them. But this was one of the main stuff. You look at it and it's like, looks simple. But actually, it is a little deeper than that. 
Because when God says about a human being, that this human being, this person is after my own heart, that's, that's not easy. So I, since I was a teenager, I wanted to understand, how can someone be a man after God's own heart? So I wanted to actually look into that. But to understand this well, we need to understand the context that this uh, verse or this statement by God came into existence. Because it came into this uh, situation when actually God was talking to Saul. He wasn't talking to the person who was after his heart yet. But he was talking to Saul. So, um, to know who was that person, we need to jump to uh, 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 chapter 16. And that is when uh, the Lord told Samuel that David is going to be the second king after Saul. So basically this statement was meant about David. God was talking here to Saul about David because he said God found a man after his own heart and uh, he will establish his kingdom forever. So. He was talking about David, and in chapter 16, we see Samuel going to Jesse's house and anointing David to be that king who will be loyal to the Lord. Uh, because after my own heart also means being loyal. So, in order to understand what does that exactly phrase mean, after God's own heart, we need to understand a little bit about the life of Saul and a little bit about the life of David and to see why God moved from Saul to David and, and, and saying this statement. So we need to a little bit look into uh, Saul's life or some incident, especially the incident that happened in here which caused God to say that. Uh, so Saul was in the battlefield and he was struggling, many of his men were leaving him and he was trying to do something and at some point he realized Saul was late to come. Or maybe he thought he was late because if we read it again, we see that just as he uh, burned the offering, Saul, uh, Samuel arrived. So actually Saul thought that Samuel was late and sometimes we think the Lord is late to do something what we're waiting for. And then arrived just that moment when we thought, oh, he's not coming, he's not going to do anything, let us do it on our own. Then we do it, and then he shows up. It's like, ah, I, I wish I just waited a little bit more. So Saul here does not wait, and then he offers the offer, which he was not supposed to do. Saul was not entitled to burn the offering and the sacrifice to the Lord. So, but that's what he did. And then immediately so, uh, Samuel arrives and he gets angry about that and then he tells him, he tells him, what is this you have done? When you hear that statement, you know that you've done something wrong. And I think Saul realized it too. But immediately Saul gives Samuel the reason he had to do that. Basically, he was afraid, my people, my, my army is leaving, I'm going to be on my own. Uh, I just felt afraid and I felt compelled to do that. So uh, he started uh, the offering by himself and then gave that as an excuse to Samuel. We see in here that Saul was more concerned about his men, his fellow men, his friends, his, uh, the army that was around him more than waiting for what the Lord has for him. And he was in a rush, in a hurry to do things faster. I talk to myself because this is sometimes me. And, um, and that's when the Lord speaks to me about things, it's, it's always me first. And then uh, we see that uh, King Saul, as the king of Israel, should have known better and shouldn't be afraid when the numbers are small because he is the first king of Israel it wasn't so long it wasn't too far in history for him to remember the days of the judges 
because the judges were ruling, you know, before the king started ruling over Israel. They were judges. And he should have remembered that Gideon only needed 300 men to fight a huge army because God gave him the power to do so. So Saul as king, if he knew God's word well, if he knew his history well, he wouldn't have been terrified like his men. He would have encouraged them and told them, hey, we've done it before with 300 men against thousands of, uh, of, of men in a different army. So he should have known better as the leader of his, uh, his people. But he didn't. He wanted to offer the sacrifice. As humans, we might sympathize uh, with, uh, with Saul. He was under pressure. He, was, uh, he had a battle to get onto. Uh, he was under this huge pressure and he needed to, uh, to do something. So we can't really blame him because he acted under pressure. Well, brothers and sisters, there's no way and there's no option and it's never okay to disobey God regardless of the situation. That's one thing we need to understand that whatever the situation is, we cannot disobey God. I know we are not uh, perfect. I know we all fall, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So. And, and you need to remember something, we, we, don't, we cannot read the whole section of the story because it's a long one. But in chapter 14, Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, takes a, a few of the people, a few of the army, and actually wins a battle over a big number of people. Because he se seeks God's face, and he prays, and he asks for a sign, and when he is given the sign, he actually goes and conquers them. With a few number. So Saul doesn't have any excuse to disobey God because we see his son just did it after that in the same battle. So, um, but if that was the situation and we might as humans say, okay, you know what, Saul had a situation, he was under pressure, he was in this situation. If we jump to 1 Samuel chapter 15, we see Saul there uh, doing something else. And I'm going to read from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to start as um, uh, also at verse 7. Uh, in, in chapter 15, the Lord asked Samuel, the prophet, to go and tell uh, King Saul that God, for God, it's time for the condemnation of the Amalekites. Because in the past, in their history, the Amalekites gave the Israelite people hard time when they moved away from Egypt. As they left Egypt, the Amalekites gave, uh, uh, gave them a very hard time. They killed many of them and they were at war with them. So now God remembered the sin of the Amalekites and he wanted to use Saul for their condemnation. So he sent Saul and he tells him clearly, destroy the Amalekites. And he says to them, he says to him this, these words. Uh, he says, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. And then Saul goes out to do that, and he prepares his army. Then, and then verse 7 says, Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to shore, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spurred Agag's <coughs> life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat cows, and the lamb, everything in fact that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. So God told him to destroy everything completely. And then we see Saul here not doing 
exactly what God told him. He kept the king Agag, and then he also kept, allowed his people to keep the, the, the goats and the cattle, and they only destroyed what was worthless. It's already junk, so they just got rid of it. But that's not what God told him. Early, in, early the next morning, so God tells Samuel, you know, so messed up. Go talk to him about this. And God gave Samuel a message for Saul. So early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. Well, in this we can see uh, definitely a pride issue was with Saul. The problem with Saul here was that he actually went to build a monument to himself. Just takes away all the glory of God. Because in, in the days, we, we don't see the people of, of God, the Israelites, throughout the history putting monuments for themselves. Every time they put something it was a reminder of God's power and help for them. And so now is putting a monument for himself. So that's the first sign of the pride issue. And then when Saul, when Samuel tells Saul about his problem, Saul starts to giving him, to give him excuses. Well, the people wanted to, you know, to keep the cattle. These they they thought uh, they were good, so we wanted to keep them. And we are going to offer them to the Lord. It's a, it's a burnt offering. We, we kept them so that we offer them to the Lord. And we can see Saul starting to give God, through Samuel of course, excuses. Well, we're going to do this for you, Lord. We're going to you know, do that. We're going to do this. And then at some point, uh, uh, Samuel also gives Saul the word of the Lord. He tells him, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offering and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And then he keeps telling Saul that the Lord rejected him at this point to be the king of Israel. So if we thought at the first incident that Saul had, you know, maybe he did what he did under pressure. In this situation with the Amalekites, he was not under pressure. He was victorious. He was there and he didn't obey God, not because he was under pressure. He was a winning person here. Actually, keeping the king uh, of the defeated enemy alive is a pride issue in itself. Because in their days, the king who was uh, triumphant would naturally bring the losing king, the, the defeated king, and would take him on his chariot as captive and would go and show, him, show off that I won over this guy. And that's what actually Saul was, was doing because he went to, to the Carmel city to build a monument for himself and he went to Gilgal. So he was, he was having a tour, a show off tour. This is what I've done, this is what I've done. And everybody was looking at it. And again, he was not willing to wait for Samuel. He wasn't willing to, to wait for the person to offer the sacrifice. And he thought, you know what? We're going to build this altar ourselves. And we're going to use the items that we got from the Amalekites to offer to the Lord. And um, in this situation, we see clearly that Saul was not under pressure to disobey God. He was simply not willing to obey God. So we need to think of that and uh, keep it in mind as we as we move on in the in the story. Also, again, we can see in here that the reasons, uh, the, the excuses that Saul was giving, he was he was again giving excuses. If you see from chapter thirteen till now, every time Samuel gives Saul a message from the Lord or rebukes him for something, Sam, Saul gives excuses. I, I did it for this reason. I did it for that reason. I did it for this and I did it for that. And in here we see him saying, 
Well, the, the, the people, the men with me at war, they thought we should keep those. Well, God told you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. I have this issue with my one of my daughters. I'm not going to give the name. But, because as they grow older, they know I was talking about them. So, I, I will try to avoid that. But one of my daughters always, I, I have certain instructions at home. You know, this is how you do things, this is how you do that. You don't do this, you don't, you do that. These are like clear instructions. For example, certain program on TV that I don't want my very young daughter, Celine, to watch. Because I don't want her to watch. While the all, older daughters don't mind watching it. Because of, you know, different age. And I'm, I'm okay with that for their age. But sometimes when Celine, the very young one, she's two years old, watching her program, which is boring for the older girls, they come and they change the, the TV. They change the channel to what they want to see. Okay? And then when I come and tell them, hey, why did you do this? They tell me, Celine told us she wants this program. All right, that's their excuse. She wants, she told us. I'm like, yes, maybe. And I go with them. Maybe she said she wants to watch something else. But I also said something. Right? I also said something to you. And here it's the same story with Saul. Well, Saul is try, trying to tell Samuel, but the people told me to bring these uh, animals, the cattle, the, the, the lamb, everything. But, but, Wait a second, so, but God already told you don't bring anything. Therefore, what are you saying? You're obeying the people more than God? That's a, that's a strong statement. You don't know what you're saying. That's what my daughters would be saying when they say, but she told us. Well, I know she told you. She's two years old and she told you something. And I'm 45 years old and I told you something. And you just listen to the two years old. And I'm the dad. I need to remind my kids all the time. I'm the dad. Your parents are the parents. Okay, girls? Yeah, your parents are the parents' kids. That's it. That's it. And God is God. We cannot just be doing things as, you know, what others want. And Saul is giving a worse excuse than actually his guilt. And that's what he was trying to do. Saul was always trying to justify himself. I want us as a family, as a church, as individuals, as a community, and even as a nation, to think of ourselves. When we are talking to God, when we read the Bible or the Word of God and want to answer to God, do we give ourselves excuses? What excuses do we use? How many times we have allowed ourselves to disobey God one time after another, creating for ourselves all kinds of excuses. Cultural excuses, emotional excuses, financial excuses, physical excuses, political excuses. I, the list can be going and going. Busyness excuses, not business, busyness excuses. I've talked to people about many things and, and I heard the, from them this answer. I have a lot going on right now. Really? When God tells you to do something, you have nothing going on anymore. <laughs> you just go on and do it. Okay? Yeah. Being busy, being in your comfort zone, being wherever you are, does not count. If we are a church, if we want to be after God's own heart, then we have to be obedient. Point blank. That's it. We cannot be at. We cannot come to the church. Not just here, everywhere. The church is not a club. The church is not a gathering. It is a beautiful gathering of God's family, but God is the parent, and we need to remember that. It's not what Celine wants. It's what the parent wants. And we need to keep that in mind. Again, I'm not saying we're perfect. And we're actually going to move on to see the life of the person that God said about 
a man after my own heart, which is David. If we jump to uh, a second Samuel, that's, a, that's a, another um, book, second Samuel chapter 11, it's a long story, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to uh, read some of it as we, as we go through. But that's when, that story, uh, second Samuel chapter 11, that is when actually uh, the uh, King David was in his palace and it's the story with Bathsheba. But it says this, I'm going to read it actually, starting from chapter 11. Actually, starting from the beginning of the chapter. It's, it's chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonites' army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Ah, it's very dangerous when the leader stays behind. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hitti. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. It's a long story, but what happens is Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, was in a battle. He was at war. And then David, realizing what happened, he wanted to go cover up for the situation because now the wife is pregnant. He calls for him, for Uriah, to come from war, and he sends them home. He sends him home. Now Uriah is a soldier, and he is ready to always be in the battle. He refuses to go to his home, and he stays at the door of the palace of his king, David. And then David realized that the second morning, he's like, oh, I didn't go home. This cover-up is not working. I need to do something. Then he calls him again. He's like, why didn't you go home? You need to be in your house. Because, you know, you just came back from war. You need to go and rest and, and uh, be with your wife. And then Uriah says, oh no, I can't do that. My fellow soldiers are in the battlefield. And the battle is going and it's raging. And I, how can I do that? How can I go home and relax? And he was my wife, uh, he uses the term wine and dine. I can't do that while my people, my, my soldiers are fighting. That shows us a little bit of distinguish here between a soldier who's ready to fight and a king who was supposed to be fighting because it was, as we read, in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war. So we see that this man, Uriah, he doesn't want to go uh, he wants to go back to the battlefield. So for two nights, three nights, he stays at the palace uh, doors where King David lives. Because he wants to be alert, in case he is needed, he will immediately jump to meet the need. That's what was uh, Uriah like. But David wasn't like that. This was, this David, King David, is a person God said earlier, this is a man after my own heart. Let's look at his, at just this, these few weeks of his situation. From the moment he was supposed to be at war and he wasn't, he was on the roof of his house and he saw Bathsheba and he did all of that. David, I'm just going to summarize a little bit what happened. 
David as king was supposed to be where kings should be at that time. He was supposed to be in the battlefield, but he wasn't. Instead, he was in his palace, relaxing, having a nap, because he woke up in the afternoon and then went here up, up to the roof, so he had a good mood. He was in his comfort zone, where he shouldn't be. While he was home as a king and leader for his people, you would expect him to be praying for the people that having in the battlefield. But he was not. He was walking on the roof. And he saw something he was not supposed to see, a naked woman, from his roof. He was supposed to be alert for any news from the battlefield to give the right advice, since he was the top commander. He was the commander of the, who was the chief commander of the army, but he was not. He sees Bathsheba and then he just wants to get to know her. So he asks about her. Just getting to know her. And after he tries to get to know her, he invites her out. Well, basically in, because she went into the castle. And when he invites her to, to his place, he ends up sleeping with her. Now committing adultery. This is the man after God's own heart. This is where it amazed me. How can God say something like this about this man? Because when, I, I, when that phrase got out my attention, a man after God's own heart, okay, so it's David, then I read the stories. Oh, David? It was all the stuff he did? And then he, it's not, it wasn't enough to commit adultery. He tries to get her husband, Uriah, to go home and sleep with her, with her wife so that he covers up for the pregnancy. Uriah is so faithful, he stays at the doors, you know, at the doors of the palace and doesn't go home. And then David is now cornered in a situation, he has to do something. What does he do? He sends Uriah back to the field, to the battlefield, with a letter. Uriah carried that message to the commander in the battlefield to put Uriah in the front lines of the battle and then withdraw from him, from behind him, and leave him to be killed. So he was betrayed. So put it in the, in the phrases here, uh, and, and, and if you want in the American terms, what do you call uh, David here? Betraying your own army? Wow. That's not acceptable, right? So he was, he, he was the king he was supposed to be fighting, he wasn't. He was to, supposed to be helping his army, he wasn't. He was supposed to be praying for his army, he wasn't. He was supposed to be uh, uh, not committing adultery, he did. And then he is committing a crime, not just committing a crime, it's a double crime because he's committing a crime against a faithful soldier. That's a crime against the whole country, the whole nation of Israel. All of that done by the man after God's own heart. I'm like, oh, that's not easy. You have to always be ready for war, for battle. When I was a kid, and I think I shared this with you before, when I was a kid during the war in Lebanon, we used to not wear pajamas. PJs were not part of our normal life as a kid in, in Lebanon. Because it was wartime, you never know when the, when the, you know, when the bombs will start falling. So we, we, we slept with our sports clothes all the time, with the shoes and the, the shoelace was always even ready open. Some nights, if, we, if my parents knew it was going to be a severe night, the shoes was on while we were sleeping. Because we never know when we're gonna run to the bomb shelter. So that's how you are ready for a battle. You're not comfortable in your own comfort zone. And unfortunately, we all sometimes do that. Now, just like Saul, God sent him Samuel to give him the message and rebuke him for the wrong that he did. Also, God sends Nathan the prophet to rebuke David for what he did. And then uh, Nathan comes to David and tells him, there was a man, a rich man, who had so much sheep, so many sheep and cattle, and there was a poor guy who only had one. And this rich man had a visitor who visited him. And the rich man, instead of using one of his own many sheep, 
to uh, slaughter or kill for uh, to make food for his visitor, he took the only sheep that his neighbor had. And David, being a just person, he was like, oh, who did this? He should be punished. And then Nathan told him, you are the man. He was referring to Uriah's wife, because King David had many wives. But this is the response of David. The moment David realized how bad his actions were, he immediately feels broken before the Lord. He immediately asks for forgiveness. He don't see him giving any excuses. I actually, read, later on, if you want to read Psalm 151, he, that's what he wrote about asking for forgiveness. He simply repented. When I thought about this, David's request for repentance, David's request for forgiveness was very genuine. He was really sorry. He felt it sincerely in his heart. He had to pay consequences because the child that Bathsheba was pregnant with died. But then God gave so, uh, King David another son from Bathsheba, and that's King Solomon. Okay, so God gave him, a, there was a consequence for what he did, but he didn't take his kingdom forever like he did with, with Saul. The reason is, David, once he realized his mistake, his problem, he immediately confessed. He immediately came back to the Lord. He immediately asked for mercy. This is what is a man after one's heart is. I'm not saying we are going to be perfect. That doesn't mean, being after God's own heart doesn't mean we are perfect. It's we are humble enough to say, Lord, I disobeyed you, I'm sorry, sincerely. If you look at, if you really, it's very beautiful and clearly you can see it. If you go back to see Saul's reaction when, Saul, when Samuel rebuked him, he was trying to get by. He said sorry. You know that Saul did say sorry? He asked for forgiveness. But if you read this Bible verses, uh, Saul was trying to say, okay, I did something wrong. Come now and, and finish the offering with me. Finish doing the sacrifice. Another time he's like, and then Samuel was so angry. He's like, no, I'm not coming with you. He's like, come on, do it because of the people. Again, again. He's not really concerned about this relationship. He was concerned about this relationship. So he was like, come on, so Samuel, don't embarrass me now, you know, for, in front of my elders, in front of my people, in front of this, in front of that. That's what, this, this is a statement he says, uh, Saul says to, to, uh, to Samuel. He's like, come on, just finish the offering with me so I don't, you know, be embarrassed now. Then, you know, even Samuel try, tries not to go. And then as Samuel tries to leave, you know, by, by force, uh, Saul tries to grab him, and he actually tore his 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 uh, you know his gown, his his cover, and then and that's when uh, Samuel turns and says, "Just as you tore this, the Lord will tore your kingdom, will tear your kingdom from you." So we see Saul say, asking for forgiveness, because if you read it, don't be mistaken. Uh, like, okay, so Saul also asked for forgiveness. No, he asked for for forgiveness just to get by. And God knows the intentions. And we see David really feeling sorry and asking for forgiveness. As a church, as a nation, as people, as individuals, what are the things that God is asking us to do that we are not doing? As individuals and then collectively as a church. I want us to remember also one thing before we get to prayer here. Sometimes sin is not doing some, something we shouldn't do. Sometimes sin is not doing what we should do. Because James chapter 4 verse, 13, uh, verse 17 says, So whoever knows 
what is good to do and does not do it is guilty of sin. So sometimes we think that, oh, you know what? I'm not doing sin. I'm, I'm not doing this wrong. But we forget that it is sin if we're not doing what is right. It's not enough not to do what is wrong. It's good not to do what is wrong. We don't want to do what is wrong. But on the other hand, we want to make sure we are obeying God and doing what is required. So maybe this is a good time for us as a church because we are all kings and we are all priests in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the, the responsibility that David had on his shoulders is not any less than the responsibility we have on our shoulders. What is our responsibility towards the city of Fort Myers, North Fort Myers, the neighborhood? What are the things that we as a church are going to do? And listen, as a church, we cannot come together in one goal if we as individuals are not coming before the Lord, seeking His face for what He wants from us on an individual basis first. You don't have time for God. You have a lot going on right now. Maybe you need to reconsider. If we as a church want to be the church after God's own heart, if we as people want to be the individuals after God's own heart, then we probably need to come before God, confess, not give excuses like Saul, but confess like David, and ask for forgiveness and move on to do something. Because if you keep going through the story, David gets up and he is called by, his, by the army commander on the battlefield, and they were winning. And he could have said, you know, I don't have to go, because they are doing well. They were doing well in the battlefield. But he gets up and he goes and joins them. And the, king, the, the, the commander tells him, hey, we're winning. If I finish it, it's going to be on my record that I finished this city and we conquered. But because you are the king, I want you to join me and be part of the conquering. And then David gets up and he goes to the field and he takes the city. And then until now we know that David took the city. God wants to give you a higher position. God wants you to be um, lifted up. But we need to be given first to him because that's what lifts him up. And when he is lifted, he lifts everybody up. Amen. Let's bow our heads to pray. At this time, as a church, but first as individuals, I would like every one of us to take a minute, seek down deep in your heart. What are the sins that are being done over and over again that instead of repenting, we excuse ourselves for? Let us search down into our hearts. Let the Holy Spirit, just like the prophets were sent by God to point out the sins in the king's lives, we as God's kings and priests have the Holy Spirit to point out the sins in our life. And again, when I say sins, it's not about something wrong you're doing only, but it's something that you need to do that you're not doing yet. Let the Lord shine with His Holy Spirit on your heart, on our hearts, so that we know what we should be doing. And if we do that as individuals, that will be us collectively as a church as well. I would like to finish for, with praying for everyone, but first I would like to see if today the Lord spoke to your heart 
and you have found something in your heart today that God is telling you to stop doing or God is telling you to start doing to give me a sign by raising your hand. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we come before you today, we come humbly. Because Lord, we know there are many things we should have done that we haven't. We know Lord, that we have disobeyed you in many ways. And we know that as a church, we desire to be the people after your own heart. Please forgive us today for the things we have done wrong. And encourage us for the things that we have done right. And help us continue. Thank you that this church is giving more than ever for the uh, uh, ministry worldwide. The, the fund that goes beyond the borders to help people come to you. Help us be your light in this community, to be your light in this city, in this nation. We pray for the church in America to do what is right and to stand up for what is right. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us because we gave ourselves excuses after excuses to do what is wrong and we call it cultural. It's accepted culturally. It's popular. Lord, forgive us for listening to fellow men and not your voice. We ask for repentance this morning. And we ask that you forgive us and give us thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Go in peace. Obey the Lord and have the blessings that come with it. And be the kings and the priests God wants you to be and wants us to be wherever we go. Amen.